It's not recording. There we go. Alright. I... <laughs> okay, so I'd like to introduce everybody to the uh, Content Keeper session today on SSL encryption. Uh, Keith Watson and Jason Green and Rex Corkin will be presenting. Keith Weltson. Weltson, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, and I'll hand off to Jason. Thanks. <clears throat> All right, this is a hot mic, everyone. So welcome again, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today in beautiful ACPE conference, which uh, in K through 12, I go to a lot of IT summits, CIO summits, conferences. This is absolutely the best in the nation. Um, JB and his team have done a fantastic job, so we thank them for having us again this year. This is our, I believe, our fourth, fourth or fifth year, fourth year. Um, my name is Jason Green again. Uh, I've been with Content Keeper for approximately five years. I've been in the filtering business in K through 12 for almost a decade. Uh, my colleague over here, David Lemon, is our director of sales. Um, I've been working with Dave for many, many years. Um, we're going to be honored by uh, hearing from Mr. Keith Welton at Lake Stevens School District. Um, who is one of our uh, premier customers and partners in the United States. Uh, and then we'll be hearing from Rex Corkin, who's our Director of Engineering. The title of our session today is The Impact of SSL Encrypted Traffic on Policy Enforcement and 21st Century Learning. So what I'm going to do is uh, just t briefly talk about what we're doing, what we're up to, then I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Keith Welton, and he can go from there. But basically, um, Content Keeper has been around for almost 17 years. We're from uh, the national capital of Australia, which is Canberra. We opened up our in our U.S. headquarters down in Orange County. We're right next to Disneyland and the Anaheim Angels. Uh, and we've grown at an incredible 187 percent rate year over year. There's a reason for that which will be discussed today in our presentation. Uh, continuous development for over 17 years, many many thousands of customers and endpoints and what do we focus on? We focus on web filtering and security, inte intelligent SSL inspection, reporting and controls which I know is very important to you folks, mobility, um, off-premise filtering, devices that you send home that are district-owned, uh, including BYOD, kids, staff members bringing their devices, monitoring, reporting, and alerting. And we also offer our own Layer 2 load balancer. This is not a third-party solution. This is our product, and it's very fantastic when you have one single pane of glass with no single point of failure with all your all the products you need for a successful filtering environment. So what I'd like to do now is I'm very proud to introduce one of our partners and uh, wonderful school district, Mr. Keith Welton from Lake Stevens School District. Let's give him a hand. You just speak into the mic. <laughs> just speak into the mic. Here's this. I'll just Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. So good afternoon, all. Um, Again, my name's Keith Welton. I work for the Lake Stevens School District. I just celebrated my 13th anniversary there in Lake Stevens. Uh, I've been there for quite a while. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's the best job I've ever had, so I love it. Um, it's a great place to be. Um, been doing, uh, like many of you in the room, I get to wear many, many hats in my district, just like all of you do. Um, and one of the hats I get to wear uh, is for uh, managing our web filtering. Um, I've got some backup that help, uh, from our crew that helped me out, but uh, at the end of the day, they come to me if, if it's not working or uh, not doing what they want it to do. Um, as you can see by the slide, um, we are growing quite a bit. Uh, we've added almost 600 kids into our district in the last year. Uh, so we're now up to 8,500 kids. Um, we have over 10,000 Chrome devices uh, currently deployed, uh, whether it's at the desktop or one-to-one, uh, -one, um, various levels of one-to-one. -one. Um, we have 12 campuses currently, and um, this time next year we'll have 14. So we're 
growth is, is going crazy. Um, we are uh, currently um, easily able to maintain um, one gig uh, out to the world. Um, while we would like to go to 10 gig, um, right now we don't have the traffic to really justify it. So we're not there yet. Um, we, uh, um, <clears throat> we know that that's the way things are going to go, but you know, it's a, it's a process. Um, I wanted to bird walk for just a second on web filtering overall and just give you some things to think about. These are discussions that we have had in our district, um, things that um, I hope will help somebody in the room. I, I mean, more than likely you guys know way more about this than I do, um, but some things that may help open some discussion, especially for those of you who may be struggling with trying to figure out how you're going to do the you know what the right way is to do web filtering in your in your district. The first thing I want to point out is web filtering philosophy 101 means what works in your district and for your kids and your community. What works in Lake Stevens, what works in Kennewick, what works in Edmonds, or what works in Battleground may not work for you. You have got to take the time to know your people. Make sure your administration team is on your side. If they are not on your side, and I mean not, not they're holding your hand as you're making changes to your web filter each week, but giving you the proper guidelines of how to manage your web filtering solution, you are going to struggle. You have got to have buy-in from not just the IT group, which most of us are part of, but you've got to have that support at the teaching and learning level and the administrative level. Get those conversations started because that's what's going to help make you successful. I'm not saying we're perfect and we got it all figured out. Nobody does, I don't think. But I will tell you that that's where it's going to start. When you get together, you need to think about who should have a voice in those discussions. Should it be little Johnny? I, in some districts, it absolutely is little Johnny and little Susie. You may have parents that should be part of those discussions. Make sure they're part of it if, if you want them to be. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to answer to your community about how you administer your filtering program at your site. <clears throat> is DNS filtering enough? Well, again, that's a discussion that you need to have at, at your, within your district. Uh, some people say, absolutely, DNS, I'm fully SIPA compliant by doing DNS filtering. Well, okay, maybe, but uh, you better make sure you know what that means when you implement that. I know there are districts throughout ACPE that say, hey, we're SIPA compliant and that's all we're going to do. And you know what? If you've got buy-off from your administrative team, your school board, and your community, you go nuts. Have a great time. More power to you. I hope, I hope it all works out. But um, it has been our experience in Lake Stevens that DNS filtering just quite really isn't enough. Uh, we feel somewhat of a moral obligation to try to help our kids the best we can. And so we've looked at other solutions besides just doing DNS filtering. Should you filter your district or your district devices that go home? Do you believe that's a responsibility you have as a school district? Some of us are going like this. Others of us are going, no, I don't want any part of that. And others of us are, you know, I'm not sure. We have taken the approach that it is our responsibility. As long as they're using our devices, um, they're going to be filtered when they leave our campus. Last but not least, and here's kind of a sticky one that some people don't ne necessarily realize. Did you know that you are not required to provide filtering for your students who are over the age of 17 or your staff? Did you know that? So think about that. I'm not saying you shouldn't, you should turn off filtering for your staff. I don't think that's a good idea from a personal opinion perspective, but make sure that you have those conversations um, when you're asked about, so that when you're asked about it, you have the proper response. Key requirements for us as far as um, web filtering. We got to be SIPA compliant because, you know, most of us like E-rate funding. It's kind of a good thing, kind of helps us out. Uh, 
helps us pay for switches and wireless and all kinds of good stuff like that. Um, so we're all under that tab. We have to, we have to be SIPA compliant. Uh, another requirement was that whatever filtering solution we chose was that we chose one filtering solution and not multiple. There are districts out there that are trying to maintain, and I, I just can't even begin to wrap my head around this, they're trying to maintain two web filters. And I don't know how you do that. I really don't. I mean, maybe, maybe you have the staffing to support that, but in a smaller district like us, we don't, we don't have that. Um, so it needed to work with everything. And uh, our primary concern outside of active directory devices was Chrome devices. Um, we wanted to ensure that if people were using Google, Bing, and YouTube, we could enforce safety search. That was really important to us. Um, and by the way, um, you can't really enforce that without SSL decryption. Um, we needed to make sure we had that intelligent SSL uh, inspection not only on campus but off campus when, when devices are at home. Uh, we put in here in the slide granular control of social media sites. So this is again another conversation that you have in your district. But um, do you um, do you allow social media? If so, to what level? Um, in our district, our students don't have much access to uh, social networking sites um, and social media. But one of the ones we do, and something that was important to us, was our staff especially at the high school level, wanted access to Craigslist for projects, for job <coughs> searches, and those kinds of things. They wanted access to LinkedIn as well. One of the uh, awesome features that, that we really liked with, with the Content Keeper solution was with Craigslist, we could actually restrict what parts of Craigslist they could access. And if you are not aware of what's on Craigslist, kids, I would highly encourage you to open up Craigslist while you're here at the, at the conference and look around for that section that says personals and then just pop in a link and see what happens. See what you get. See if you like the results there. See if you think it's okay that your 12-year-old daughter or 13-year-old son is accessing that section of Craigslist. I would be willing to bet that most responsible parents wouldn't want them there. Just saying. Uh, it was also important that our teachers could manage YouTube videos. Um, until YouTube and Google kind of worked that out, there was a little disparity there. Now that's completely solved and working well. Um, it was also important that we could easily manage and maintain our own, our own filtering solution without having to make a phone call every time we wanted to make a change. That was a really important uh, part of our, our criteria. And then last but not least of our key requirements was what kind of support do you get when you need to make the call or send an email? So we did it. Um, I was talking to, to Ron before the, before the session began, and he talked a little bit about how um, they, they looked at a lot of different web filters when they were doing their filter search, and we did the same thing. It was really important that we tried them out, got our hands dirty, see how they functioned. Was it easy to make changes? to different policies. How hard was it to enforce those policies? That was super important. Um, when we first made contact with Content Keeper here a few years ago, um, Chromebooks and Chrome devices were kind of starting to take hold and there weren't a lot of solutions out there to be able to filter those devices. Um, I'm not saying Content Keeper was the first to have an extension for a Chrome device, but they were pretty close. They, are, they were one of very few at the time that had that. Um, and that was, that had to be, that was like a, a non-negotiable point for us. If it didn't, if we didn't have that capability, we were gonna move on. So, uh, again, back to support. So I tell this story about support to people when they ask, well, how's your support? Well, here's how support is. Um, when we first started with Content Keeper, uh, we were also in the throes of changing our domain and, and Active Directory uh, structure. We had a multi-domain um, forest that was had some real bad issues, and we had finally worked to the point where we were at one flat domain, and things seemed to be going okay. 
but then all of a sudden the filtering wasn't working correctly um, as we were going through our proof of concept and so we were trying to figure it out and you know what did we change well we just added content keeper maybe it's their fault well so we called up support and we start looking at things and they're like you know I we think you got a DNS problem they're like oh, okay and I expected well you know good luck with that hope it goes well click no that's not what happened what happened was they sat there on the phone and helped us troubleshoot our DNS problem on the spot not oh here's a bill for that uh, that um, consultant time we just gave you but they helped us solve it and most companies don't do that so as you think about support you know we all have to think about support in the various products we purchase think about that um, they also continue to develop uh, their product and which we we think that's awesome they continue to ask for input they take that input and they take it to their developers we came up with something on the reporting at early on we said you know we really need this well Rex and his team reached out to the developers in Australia and we had a fix in two days it was awesome um, I don't I don't like to just get up and say oh nice things about this vendor or that vendor but in this particular case for us anyway content keeper has been a huge win um, we've gotten fantastic support from them and because of that um, we've also gotten great support from uh, our school board or administration team and they love it they just absolutely love it they love the reporting uh, and the great information that's there and the last reason we chose content keeper was scalable scalability was key because we knew, just like all of you know, your, your, your world's growing. It won't be long and your pipes may be 10 gig to the web. We needed to make sure that, that, was cap that we were capable of doing that and they offered that. And um, I don't know how much Rex is gonna get into load balancing and so forth, but um, that is definitely something that was really important to us. So um, I, I would encourage you that as you um, are, as you're fighting your own web filtering battles in your districts or where you're at, um, I would tell you that at least make a call and ask some questions if you're interested. Um, I hope that um, as you guys continue to go through this presentation, as, as Rex presents a little bit more on SSL, um, how important that is and why um, it does make a difference when you're trying to filter the stuff that you, you're being asked to filter by your uh, by your district and your community. Rex? Thanks. thanks. So thank you all for coming out and uh, thank you for your time. Uh, SSL decryption is a, a really big subject and I'm going to try to cover as much as I can in a very short amount of time. Uh, my name is Rex Cork and I'm the lead engineer for Content Keeper North America. Um, I deployed this technology four years ago in a county office in California. I was so impressed by the product that I called Dave Lemon. He'll tell you about it. I picked up the phone. I called him. I said, you need to hire me so I can go out and show these, show people what's capable today in web filtering because back then nobody was decrypting, okay? So what I'm going to do really quick, I, I have to assume that there's some in here that don't understand the technology fully, so I'm going to try to go through this as quick as I can. Um, I'm not going to be able to cover everything, so if you have questions for me, uh, I will be at the booth during the show, so let me know. Um, the topics I'm going to try to cover is, how much time do I have, Dave? Okay. The topics I'm going to try to cover today is, what is SSL? What impact does it have on K-12 learning? Uh, SSL options for K-12, huh? 40 minutes. Okay, perfect. Um, SSL options for K-12 districts. Uh, available technologies, scalability, speed and accuracy, utility. Um, what do you get out of SSL decryption? What can you, what should you expect if you decide to go through a project to decrypt your traffic? Um, the ability to achieve the desired result. That's what we're looking for. Uh, de the, point, the deployment process. How does it work? How do you go about uh, getting this service enabled on your on your network and reporting and alerting? And then I'll try to leave a little bit of time for questions. So I remember when, when I met Keith, I met Keith uh, up at the, um, the, the where the, 
table, the little mingling room up upstairs, and I probably spent the most time with Keith. Uh, he was, I knew when I met Keith that he was going to put my product through more paces than anybody that I'd ever met, and that proved to be uh, very accurate. Uh, the first thing I will say about, about SSL is if you're thinking about deploying it on your network, you need to test it. You need to test it at some level, and if possible, test it in your entire network. Vendors can show you SSL in a very small environment, and they can make it work. You, the scalability is going to be a huge problem. So what is SSL? SSL is basically a technology that's designed to privatize traffic. So when you go to your bank site on your phone, you put in your password, you don't even think about it. Matter of fact, most of you probably don't even look for the lock anymore because you depend on this technology to privatize your traffic, right? So the goal is to, to provide privacy and reliability between two known entities, typically a server and a host. Your laptop, your phone, your workstation, and Wells Fargo. That's what it's really designed for. So this is great for online banking, social media, electronic communications such as email, personal browsing, that, type, that, type, that kind of thing. But it really provides some serious challenges for K-12 and has really since since Google purchased YouTube, that's when it really became apparent that we were going to need to get some granular control of, of encrypted traffic. So what impact does it have? It gives you an immediate loss of granular control past the top level domain. Top level domain is something like Google.com. So there's technology available for, for a, a device to establish a connection to uh, to say Google, for example. When it does, uh, appliance vendors can see the certificate. So the certificate says google.com or gmail.com or translate.google.com, we can see that. That means I can, make, I can take action on it, number one, and I can log it. However, once they log in, it establishes the connection and you're done. Every packet that comes through, you're going to see that as Google.com. That's all you're going to see. That means you can't log it. You can't control it. There's, you basically have two choices, allow or block. Okay. A really good example of this, and I'm sure that most of you have seen this, is sites.google.com. Sites.google.com has a ton of educational uh, information on it. But if you can't see past that that uh, HTTPS Google.com, if you can't see the bad content, you can't stop it. So this is problematic because if you allow that, uh, sites today, chances are your kids are playing games all day, P unblocked games, 66 unblocked games, 77 unblocked games, and just recently we've been getting uh, customers calling saying, how can we block movies? Because the kids are watching rated R movies. So this, these are the types of things that you've got to be uh, worried about if you're providing content uh, with encryption. You have immediate loss of, of previously available tools. So safety features are typically handled by some kind of browser flag or cookie. If it's encrypted, we can't see the setting. So if the kid goes in and turns off the safety feature, you don't get to see that. With our product and um, the, the, our ability to decrypt the traffic and the safety features we have, we're going to decrypt that traffic in real time, and we're going to uh, enforce the safety features. A complete loss of reporting past the top level domain. So you've lost all of your keyword searches. And some vendors can actually give some level of keyword searches. Depends on how the URL is passed to the filter. But in general, you cannot guarantee you're seeing your, any, any of your search engine traffic, none of that stuff. OK? So let me get on here. So those are the real challenges, right? You have the loss of control and the loss of reporting uh, and also safety features. So what are your options? You can ignore it. So basically, some districts choose to ignore this. They choose to not deal with it, and I see it every day. Uh, ignoring, ignoring typically leads to overblocking. So when the, when the staff members start complaining because the kids are playing games all day, you're going to end up blocking sites.google.com. But now the educators that have built their own sites and have found other good resources on sites, that educational content is no longer available. Okay? 
Um, you can use the suboptimal sub workaround, something like a DNS redirect, but when you do those, it affects everybody on the network because everybody's using the same DNS. So these are not really the optimal methods to actually address this problem. Or you can decrypt it. So it is possible to decrypt SSL in real time. We've been doing it for years. We do it in sub-milliseconds. And I'm going to talk a little bit about scalability. But there's different levels of decryption available. And these, di these different levels of decryption are necessary. For corporate sites, banks, that kind of stuff, we decrypt everything, right? We decrypt every URL. But for school districts, that's not necessarily possible. And the reason why is what some of the technology starts to clash. For example, um, if you have Chromebooks and you want to onboard your Chromebooks, you cannot decrypt some Google traffic. The reason why is that device needs to communicate with Google to get the certificates down to be able to decrypt. A lot of vendors are struggling with this. You turn on decryption, it breaks the, the network. We've actually fixed that. We, we fixed it three years ago. And we're actually on our third generation SSL engine to address exactly these problems, okay? So what we provide also, we can decrypt everything or we can selectively decrypt. Yes? We don't have any problems with SSL pinning. All of our customers are using our technology to, to accomplish the things that they're trying to accomplish. Um, what we do is we have technology built in the SSL engine that allows us to onboard Chromebooks, allows you to use applications like uh, Google Drive on your Windows devices without breaking all of your Google traffic. You cannot decrypt drive.google.com from an application on a Windows workstation. It's impossible. The application itself does not trust the certificate, right? If you, if, if you want to decrypt Google, we can, or Google Drive, we can decrypt Google Drive in the browser because it adheres to the machine certificate. However, we don't have problems with certificate pinning, per se, okay? So, moving on. Uh, if, you, if, you, if anybody has more in-depth questions and want to discuss this stuff and want to come meet with me afterwards, that's perfectly fine. I'm, I'm, I'll answer any questions you folks have. Um, I can actually also show you examples and a live demonstration of what we do uh, if you want as well. So how do I get started? There's several methods available to decrypt traffic. Uh, the technology behind the way that the appliance decrypts is extremely important, okay? Some vendors use forward proxies, some use other methods. It's very important that you investigate the, the vendor's ability to turn the system on. What's it going to do at 500 megs? What's it going to do at a gig? What's it going to do at two gigs? You have to make sure that the vendor has a proven record with these services on and running at scale. Okay? Our system, we can decrypt uh, two and a half gigs on a system on one of our 1U appliances with no problem. Okay? We can scale up with you as well, up to 10 gigs. That's not an issue for us. Um, so you might thinking, well, I'm not an expert. What, how am I going to, how am I going to, uh, you know, deploy SSL on your network? If for our customers, we actually fully support our customers. So a lot of vendors are really trying to figure this out. So when people come to us and say, I tried it with this vendor, but we couldn't get the search deployed, that's not going to happen with our system. Uh, Keith will tell you, Forrest will tell you, we provide every piece of documentation. If you don't know how to do it, my guys will do it with you. We have all kinds of ways to accomplish this process with you. Um, how do I know if a vendor can meet my district's needs? This is really difficult because there are firewall vendors out there that can decrypt. I'm not going to deny that, but to have the tools available to be able to do this is tricky. So my, my recommendation is test it on your network at full scale. And we do it all the time. We'll do full POCs. If someone's seen pricing, they like what we do, we will actually proof a concept this on your network and decrypt it. So we will provide proof that we do everything that we do. So let's talk about uh, scalability, speed, and accuracy. This is very important. If you're going to deploy this technology, you're going to run into four major problems. Number one is scalability. When you turn it on, what's going to happen to the appliance? Okay, uh, Almost every vendor out there 
we get all of their customers that tried to turn it on at scale and it failed. So um, I'm not saying that nobody can do it. I can tell you today that we are doing this every day and we, do, uh, we turn this on day one in our deployment. So we, we're scaling this up with no issue. Usability, it has to be usable. Uh, we consistently hear, well, we turned it on and it, it worked for a little while and we had to turn it off. Or we turned it on and it broke, uh, you know, all my Google services stopped working. Or I had to make white lists for all these SSL websites. I, I realize that there's vendors out there having that issue. We're not, okay? Um, does the technology scale with the customer? We're going to scale with you. We're going we're gonna to size the deal out for your three-year contract, and you're not going to have to go back to the well for, for hardware. Um, hardware costs and footprint. From, from the information that I, I can tell you today, our system will decrypt at higher speed rates than anybody out there by far. So scalability is not an issue for us. We're going to have a much smaller footprint. Uh, decryption cannot negatively impact end users. This is really important. If you turn this service on and it slows down someone's uh, Gmail, you're going to turn it off. That's a fact. So we have to make sure that the vendor that you're using can decrypt it in real time. And we do it in sub-milliseconds. So below a millisecond, we're delivering these packets. Uh, state testing. These are things that you got to watch out for. Um, just because you may not be decrypting your state testing, but if that appliance is struggling, it's going to affect your state testing, okay? Um, these are all things that we are able to get by. Um, user disruption. You can't disrupt the users. The SSL sites have to be available at all times. Administrative overhead. Uh, sites must be decrypted cleanly and reliably. I've seen white lists of hundreds from other vendors because when they turn it on, they get a phone call, I can't get to this website, is it SSL? Yes, they whitelist and it works. We don't have this problem. Okay, what should I gain? So here's the real thing. You should ex have some expectations if you're gonna go through the process of deploying certificates and turning this service on. So the first thing is, here's a great example. You should be able to allow sites.google.com, uh, my math sites, but you should be able to block play fun blocked, okay? or P unblocked. And, and those of you that have run into this, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is just one example. We can, we can do things like, uh, we can allow Yahoo, but block Yahoo Celebrity, block Yahoo TV. We can block the Yahoo search altogether. What we're gonna do is we're gonna, we have tools in the product to actually give you utility for the service. So if you wanna see a little bit more <coughs> about that, uh, see us at the booth. So, we can actually set entire domains to read only, like Facebook, Twitter. We can just we can allow the kids to go to them, but we can block those type that type of behavior. So if you want to allow Facebook and not let them post their status, we we provide those services as well. Uh, uh, Keith uh, mentioned the Craigslist, very important. Uh, we can prevent commonly used educational tools from uh, being used to circumvent the filter. Not sure if you've seen this, but you can go right into translate.google.com. And you can translate NFL.com, the full page. If you can do that, you can use your imagination. If you do that on our, on our system, not only will you get blocked, but you'll get a blocked page. So that's another thing that we do. We provide blocked pages for every, for every block. So if it's HTTP or HTTPS, we don't just leave you hanging with a white page that says TCP reset. We deliver blocked pages. So um, keyword blocking. In all of your search engines, Craigslist, YouTube, all of your search engines, if you type in XXX and you've got it set to block for that policy, it's going to block it, okay? And we're going to deliver a block page. Safe search features, we're going to give you that. We're going to handle it. We're not going to force you to use um, DNS.